Good evening and welcome to This Week in Bigfoot, the new show that scours the internet and the Bigfoot community each and every week so you don't have to. Then we take it and wrap it up in a nice, neat 30-minute package. If it has to do with Bigfoot, Sasquatch, or the Wild Man, we'll fill you in and let you know right where to find it. So settle in for another episode of This Week in Bigfoot. Our top story today is Sasquatch Legend Meets Science 2 stalled in production. The director says no. When Sasquatch Legend Meets Science was released in 2003, Doug Hycheck was just 43 years old. Now, at age 64, the celebrated director is having a tough time finding a network for his latest project, Sasquatch Legend Meets Science 2. The three-time Emmy-nominated director sat down with Tim and Dana Halloran on the Bigfoot Influencer Show recently to talk about the project. Yeah, so are you guys currently working on it right now, Doug? I work on it every day. Okay. But I'm not filming. I'm doing pre-production still every single day. Okay. This is not a day so, that goes I mean, by. Do you I'm have like a out. timeline for when you think I had a, <clears throat> I had a timeline two years ago. Okay. <laughs> then, COVID, yeah. then COVID hit. Yeah. And I hooked up with a network that said, oh, well, we're interested. They strung okay. me along a long time. Finally got a no. Mm -hmm. Then I hooked up with another network. They strung me along. Then I hooked up with recently um, even IMAX. I met with them. They were interested in it and doing a 3D Mm -hmm. IMAX movie, Turning Legend Meet Science. So that mm -hmm. took, you know, time. And eventually I got a no on that. Um, so now it's just a little old me again. The original Legend Meet Science was a breakthrough in both scientific Bigfoot research and filmmaking. As you can tell by the interview, regardless of network support, High Check is moving forward with the project, which promises long overdue advances in evidence testing, scientific review, and overall production quality. The director has been busy both in pre-production of the film and keeping his fans updated through his Facebook page. We wish him luck and look forward to the film's eventual release, regardless of where it lands. Show host Pat Turner continued his anti-squatch sauce campaign this week with an open invitation to Bigfoot researchers to put up or shut up and to stop the rhetoric as he puts it and actually show some evidence that Bigfoot exists. Let's check it out. Uh, but basically... You researchers, and especially the researchers that, you know, are very active in the public sphere of the Bigfoot community, because I, I think it's time to have a more serious discussion. Um, as a whole, I mean, I'm not going to like, I'm not going to call any individuals out, but as a whole, really, it's just... Uh, all I'm seeing is narrative and rhetoric. That's it. So I'm going to have a different conversation. And the conversation I'm going to have revolves around evidence. And what evidence is there? You know, what evidence are you, as a researcher, what evidence are you bringing to the table and, and or could bring to the table? And why and how? Not narrative, not rhetoric, um, but real evidence. How do we move the ball down the field? This is sort of an open invitation to start having those discussions, which for some of these people, or hell, any of them, really, uh, it's going to be a different kind of discussion, one that you're not used to. But I think it's important to have, and, and important to have in a fair way. It's not, it's not a, you're full of crap thing, but it's also not, oh, wow, that's amazing. You know, like this, this is a, about real evidence. Now, for as long as I've known him, Pat hasn't been afraid to speak his mind. And this episode is a great example of that and why we need harder edge shows like Squatch Talk. Shows not afraid to call those so-called researchers out who really aren't doing much of anything to move the ball forward in regard to actually understanding this Bigfoot thing. 
because they're all too busy constantly congratulating each other over speculative evidence. So good job, Pat. We wish you luck, and we'll keep an eye on your progress. Next up, is Google actually tracking Bigfoot? For more on the story, here's Mike Lucci. A new feature in Google Maps was recently launched that actually allows users to track reports of Bigfoot, UFOs, and other unexplainable phenomena near their homes. The crowdsourced map titled Bigfoot UFO and More Sightings was started by filmmaker Thomas Markham of the Crypto Crew back in 2014. It currently has over 1.3 million views and allows anyone to contribute their own reports. The map currently features over 360 documented encounters in the United States, Canada, Australia, and Northern Europe, with more than 250 of them supposedly being Bigfoot related. Any report the project receives undergoes a stringent vetting process that even involves sending a local researcher to the site where it allegedly occurred. Along with Bigfoot and UFOs, the sightings map also features reported encounters of other cryptids like the Thunderbird, Dogman, even mermaids, and other humanoid beings. While the launching of this new Google Map feature does indeed give researchers and enthusiasts another database to utilize, it also provides another resource to help identify potential hotspots and other patterns that may emerge from the data collected. It's time for a new segment on This Week in Bigfoot. It's part of the show where we give researcher and content creator Mike Merchant screen time to speak his mind and get whatever's bothering him off his chest. We call it Two Minutes With. How many Bigfoot are there? I had one guy tell me he thought there was one, one Sasquatch. There was a Bigfoot personality that left a comment. Too many Bigfoot. Could you explain to me why? Not enough sightings, dude. Sometimes people don't know. Other, other times they're just they're just being trolled. I don't have enough sightings, dude. This very same individual had done a video where he claimed there were tens of thousands of eyewitnesses. How many Bigfoot do you think that's going to be? One? Are we seeing the same Bigfoot a thousand times? No strategy, no details, no protocol. Just going to reach down and pull this right out. Just going to pull it out. Out of nowhere, I'm gonna ridicule somebody that says the exact same thing I said. Darn, I forgot I said that. That bit me in the in the butt, didn't it? How many Bigfoot are there? That's a good question. Waste our times with these endless, unproductive debates about whether the eyewitnesses are credible. He was confused, befuddled, hallucinating, and I'm pretty sure he's a liar. I had another guy tell me that my calculations were way off. They're not like bears. They're more like cougars. I was like, well, that's fair. How many cougars in Oregon? 6,000. They've got three times the land mass of Maine. That would be 2,000 cougars. What do you know? That was my estimate for Bigfoot. 2,000 Bigfoot. Even though I used his suggestion, he still told me I was wrong. It's only about 300. No, no reason for this. How do you do these estimations? We haven't tagged any of them. We haven't done a census. How do you know how many there are? This is after doing like three videos where that's all I talked about was, was how I calculated out the population of Sasquatch. Calculate it out. I want other other people to do their own calculations. It'd be much more accurate if a whole bunch of people did their calculations and then we found the, the average, found the mean. No, I'm not going to come up with a better way. I'm just going to ridicule how you're doing it. You're doing it wrong. And I don't think those numbers jive. They don't seem correct. Too many. Too many Sasquatches. It's not Sasquatches. It's Sasquatch. Too many Sasquatch. Stop using it as a plural. Surely you know the difference. Stop calling me Shirley. It's not like they got to come up with a formula. I even provided the formula and talked about the variables in great depth. The equation's not that difficult. Plug in your own values. Plug in your own values and come up with a number. How many Bigfoot are there? Is Bigfoot roaming the frozen plains of the Mount Rushmore state? For more on this story, here's Mike Lucci. So yeah, basically a listener of the Sasquatch Chronicles podcast, uh, they recently wrote to the show and submitted a picture of an alleged Sasquatch taken in South Dakota. The unnamed listener claims it was taken by their friend's father while truck driving. The figure in question was reportedly standing alongside the road when it was initially spotted and wound up getting much further away from the road by the time the truck driver was able to pull out their phone to take the picture. Those who believe the photo is genuine point to details like the subject's long arms, and seeming lack of a neck, while some even estimate its height to be in the seven to nine foot range. Skeptics who say the photo is inconclusive cite its alleged secondhand origins, along with the subject's distance and lack of detail, while some more astute observers even question why there isn't a footprint trail leading up to the figure in the snow. 
There's no denying the photo and its backstory are missing some important pieces of information that could definitely shed light on its authenticity, like when and where in South Dakota it was supposedly taken, along with what type of phone was used to take the photo. Although South Dakota doesn't have a renowned history of Bigfoot encounters, more than 68% of the state's reports on the BFRO's public database come from two spots, the Black Hills National Forest in the western part of the state and Standing Rock Reservation in the northern part of the state. In 1977, more than two dozen sightings of the Bigfoot-like creature occurred over a four-month span around the town of Little Eagle, which happens to lie east of the Standing Rock Reservation. The reports generated statewide attention and are among the largest concentration of documented Bigfoot sightings that happened in a specific area outside of the Pacific Northwest. So I'll throw this back to you, Brendan. What other pieces of information uh, do you need to give this photo any degree of uh, authenticity? Well, I think we should first start with the metadata from the camera and the image and see where that leads us, then talk to the truck driver and see what his motivations are, if he has any. I know driving a truck, a semi, and taking a photo is not the easiest thing in the world to do. So I'm highly skeptical of this photo um, to begin with, and that's that's where I stand on this one. Chuck, what do you think? It looks like the Bigfoot from that Detloff Pass episode. That's what I think. Uh, you know, very foggy. And like you said, it should be more photos if, you know, just not the one money shot. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. The other thing, too, um, you know, like one of the people who observed, who, who commented on it, they made a really good point. If it was originally spotted alongside the road and it made it that far back, I mean, there's snow on the ground. It's probably like really more, you know, it's probably like really muddy, marshy uh, grass. He's grass the subject's walking on. Why isn't there a footprint trail leading up to where it is? This week, we're taking a look at a Bigfoot book, Trail of the Sasquatch, A Shaman's Journey by Donald B. Young Jr. This book is an autobiography of a man tutored by an old shaman Indian when he was young. The author was halfway through his schooling when his teacher passed away, trapping him between the modern world and the world of his teacher, a Native American shaman. Like most shaman, his teacher regarded Sasquatch as a spirit and seemed to have a deep understanding of how the creature would act and why. As he got older, Young continued to have Bigfoot encounters and ended up joining the BFRO to help prove the creature actually exists. After reading this, I do believe the author is telling his story as honestly as he can. I don't really think he understands it all, and to be honest, neither do I. But I do think he's doing his best to tell his interesting life story. The book is worth reading if you can accept that there are things out there in the world that occur that we cannot really explain, and you're interested and open to ancient spiritual beliefs. Today's episode of This Week in Bigfoot is sponsored by Gut Knockers Apparel and Clothing. From hoodies and caps to soaps, keychains, and bats, Gut Knockers has everything you need to show your love of Bigfoot. For more information and to shop their items, be sure to visit the Gut Knockers page on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Gut Knockers. Hey, Gut Knockers? It's time to check in with our buddy Connor Flynn, a.k.a. Bigfoot Anon, and his show, Donnie's Bigfoot Hotspots. In this episode, researcher Donnie Miller from Standing Goats Rescue takes outcast paranormals Matt and Connor on a skunk ape tour around his farm. We're at the 32-minute, 10-second mark here. And I was sitting in that, and stuff was hitting the tree. Coming from back this way. Wow. And I could hear it hit, and then I'd hear it hit the ground, but I never, nothing ever passed me and landed out there. It would hit the tree. So, does that break? I Definitely break. sounds like some movement and break over there to the right. Right where you're talking about, you're getting that feeling. Yeah, from. right over there. I thought I heard it too. Yeah, I'm we'll just go around over here. And if y'all are right with it, I don't like it near. It could be anything, but I just, that's just a critter I don't want to take chances with. Time to pack up and go, I mean, it was so bad. And when I turned around, I was filming, and I knew it was that general area. I knew it was somewhere, you know, in that path. And I zoomed in on the camera where I thought it was. I was moving it around, but I didn't see it. And I went ahead and turned, and I, and I got out. But mm -hmm. then, 
the guy watching the video, he's seen it. And he sent uh, to Jeff, he gave Jeff the timestamp of where it was at, and I couldn't find it. Now, I have to say, I'm a big fan of Connor's work, his filming style, and the energy he brings to his projects. And whether you're into Skunk Ape or not, you have to admit, he's a hell of a lot of fun to watch. For more information and to donate to Standing Goats Rescue, visit standinggoatsrescue.weebly.com. In researcher news, Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum honestly believes Bigfoot will one day be discovered. For more on this, once again, here's Mike Lucci. In a recent interview, Dr. Jeff Meldrum of Idaho State University explained why he thinks squatches are so successful at avoiding detection and what the circumstances behind their discovery might look like. When British digital online publication Lad Bible asked Dr. Meldrum how a Bigfoot can continue to remain hidden in the 21st century, he said it was likely due to its extreme rarity and low population numbers. For context, Dr. Meldrum believes the North American Sasquatch population is somewhere in the two to 3,000 range. Dr. Meldrum thinks squatches have long lifespans, reproduce infrequently, and could have home ranges up to 1,000 square miles. Consider how nearly half of North America is uninhabited. Most Bigfoot supposedly live in remote wilderness and try to avoid human contact. Reasons like this are why Dr. Meldrum doesn't think it's not hard to believe most squatches could go their entire lives without even seeing a human. Dr. Meldrum does believe Bigfoot will eventually be discovered, but his envisioning of how it happens is pretty mundane. Dr. Meldrum says an eventual discovery will happen either through persistent investigation or purely by chance. Elaborating on the latter, he says one of a few commonly discussed scenarios will most likely occur. Either one will eventually get shot by a hunter, struck by a vehicle, or someone will accidentally discover remains. When asked if he would like Bigfoot to be discovered, given humanity's role in the extinction of several apex predators throughout history, Dr. Meldrum says he still wants it to happen, saying we do best when we know the most about something. Do Bigfoot speak an actual language? And like humans, are there different Sasquatch dialects? In 1971, Ron Moorhead and Al Berry recorded what many consider to be the famous smoking gun of Bigfoot audio, the Sierra Sounds. These recordings have been called the audio equivalent of the Patterson-Gimlin film and are an undeniable piece of evidence relating to Bigfoot. The audio has been widely studied and scientifically analyzed and is the best known evidence of vocal communication between multiple Bigfoot. The question asked by so many researchers is, does Bigfoot have the ability to speak a spoken language? Now in this video, Hidden Existence Channel host Daniela takes a look at the hyoid bone and whether Bigfoot have one. This is the bone needed for speech. Let's check it out. The hyoid first appeared in the fossil records some 800,000 years ago. The differentiation of the hyoid between modern humans, Neanderthals and the great apes suggest why we can speak and the great apes only vocalize. The hyoid and larynx of Neanderthals are almost identical to modern humans. The shape and location of the hyoid in our bodies is what gives humans the ability to speak. In general, humans are the only animals in which the hyoid is in the right position to work in unison with the larynx and the tongue, enabling us to speak. In theory, if Bigfoot as a primate has a language in a verbal sense, then they would need to be equipped with these anatomical features. One aspect in the anatomy of great apes is intriguing. It's the laryngeal air sacs located in the throat. Humans lack these air sacs and humans lack the hyoid with the pronounced cup shape in the middle. The combination of air sacs and hyoid shape in the great apes is very distinctive in comparison between humans and apes. In a paper published by the University of Amsterdam, it is proposed that an air sac would reduce the ability to produce distinctive speech, but would enhance the impression of size of the vocalizer. With the presence of air sacs and great apes, lower frequency sounds and smaller acoustic range is the result. They are capable of making louder percussive booming noises. Witnesses have reported very loud screams, roars and other various vocalizations from Bigfoot. Witnesses have also reported and recorded alleged speech from them. 
The possibility does exist that Bigfoot could, in fact, have a hominid-shaped hyoid and vocal trackway as well as the air sacs. The evolutionary process could have resulted in this combination. Tonight's edition of This Week in Bigfoot is sponsored by Broken Branch Designs. From outerwear and clothing to home and garden decor, Broken Branch Designs has everything to do with Sasquatch. For more information, visit BrokenBranchDesignsLLC.com. It's time to bring you up to speed on a couple of recent podcasts. First up, Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, episode 366, I Didn't Know Anything About Sasquatch. In this episode, show guest Mary tells of her very first Bigfoot sighting while on, you guessed it, a last-minute camping trip with family and friends. We pick it up with 42 minutes left in the show. We get to the point where it, it, it starts to turn, the open area starts to turn a little bit, and it's still going down at the same time. And a friend of mine goes, what is that thing? And they're looking ahead, and they're looking to my left, and I'm facing downward, and I look up, and it's also to my left, and I see this being standing there, just standing. And I'm not really sure what I'm looking at. It is an all-white being, and it's standing behind a smaller bunch of trees and these trees are probably about to give you some context they're they're a type of pine tree i think it's a long leaf pine needle tree so they get kind of really bushy on the ends and they look like little bushes when they're when they're small and so it's standing behind some of those the tallest tree in that little stand was probably not more than four feet so it wasn't necessarily trying to hide it was definitely watching us now how long it had been watching us i don't know now, it's worth mentioning that this isn't Mary's first appearance on a cryptid podcast. She had appeared on episode 440 of Dogman Encounters, where she talked about the various dogman sightings she had had. So make of that what you will. Next, we're taking a look at Bigfoot Society, episode 231, Oregon Bigfoot. In this exciting episode, lifelong Oregon resident George shares his Bigfoot encounters with show host Jeremiah. George had his first sightings way back in the 1980s while working as a woodcutter. And since then, he has had several more Bigfoot sightings. Let's listen in. This comes five minutes and 12 seconds in to the 27-minute show. The moon was out that night, so you could see uh, th uh, across through the forest. You could see the bushes and stuff. At two in the morning, I'm sound asleep. Whatever happened, I don't know, but I snapped awake. And I looked uh, in front, 50 feet away, there was a big fallen tree that was about four feet thick. And behind this tree was a fuzzy animal. All I could see, it was, it was behind the tree, kind of with its arms on the tree. So all I could see was from the waist up. And so I'm looking directly into its eyes. I, I'm not afraid, probably foolishly. And I'm looking, I'm thinking, gee, that's a bear, uh, what I thought. Then I was thinking, bears have big, fuzzy, round ears. This thing had no visible ears. So I knew what bears look like. And this thing did not have a flat head like a bear. It kind of had a, a cone-shaped head. Well, at the time, I didn't think Bigfoot. I just looked at it, looked at it. And I would guess it was about maybe 300, 350 pounds. So in, in the Bigfoot world, that's a small one. Anyway, I thought, well, I'll wake my partner Bill up. So I looked over, pushed on him, pushed on him. He wouldn't wake up. I looked back, and of course, the Bigfoot was gone. I didn't hear brush crackling, so it must have snuck off pretty well. So this is something to remember. When you see a Bigfoot, the minute you take your eyes off, they're going to disappear. The next show we're going to take a look at today is Strange Familiars, Fireside Tales of Pandemonium. In episode 377 of this long-running show, and one of my favorites, to be honest with you, hosts Allison and Tim head back to Pennsylvania's Pandemonium to listen to the experienced woodman Chad interview the Canadian Bushcraft podcast host, Caleb, about his encounters with Bigfoot. Let's take a listen. There's no, like, when we're talking about the pine cones in the last talk we were talking yeah. about. Yeah. How there's, like, divots in the ground of where they've been sitting for a while. Mm -hmm. There's nothing on the ground of where the stick should have come from. Nowhere. I'm looking around, and it's just pine floor or sticks that are already there. There's no missing, there's no, um, 
negative of the positive that there was, like the stick that would have been in that spot. So I start looking around, looking around, and I just happen to look up, and about 11, 12 feet up, there's a ponderosa pine branch that's been twisted and twisted and twisted until it broke. It looks like a Twizzler, like a licorice Twizzler. And just the end is green stick. And I'm like, that? Do you know of any animal that can grip and twist like that? Like a bear can kind of cup something with both hands and turn it. Raccoons can do things, but they can't twist a wrist thick stick. No, hell no. And then throw it 110 something yards. Yeah. So I start going back down and I find that stick and it's green. And it's got the same fractures on the end of it. I didn't take it all the way back up and, you know, stick it in because that's 11 well, feet. Well, no, up. no. You can pretty much tell. I mean, It's the stick. Yeah. So something saw us, ripped a branch 11 or 12 feet up, twisted it off until it broke, and then flung it 100-something yards out of the woods and into the open and stuck itself in the ground like a javelin. That's crazy. Like the force behind that throw. I never figured out what it was. And to this day, I, like, I could say it's Kichisabe, I could say it's a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot or something of that special lineage or something. I don't know. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with not knowing what that was because I gave it tobacco, I you'll, gave it food. To and be honest, you'll on. never know. We're, we're not supposed to know. When I die, maybe I'll know. Somebody in the next life will tell me what I was dealing with out here and they'll be like, yeah, you should have watched less of uh, less TikTok and spent more time in the woods or something. Now, Strange Familiars was one of the first shows I started to follow regularly while I was forming the CARC, and with good reason. The hosts are genuine, the stories are captivating, and the show quality is excellent. For more from Allison and Tim, be sure to go to strangefamiliars.com. Up next, Bigfoot Buckeye. Bigfoot Buckeye, Bigfoot on the Alcan Highway, keep your eyes open. In this episode, the Alcan woman describes her two incidents to show host Nan, Incidents that happened 22 years apart. Let's take a listen. This is a 7 minute 33 second mark. And then looking ahead at a small cement bridge that crossed a marsh area. And that's when I saw movement. My eyes adjusted to what was approaching from the shoulder of the road. My mouth dropped open in disbelief. It was a Bigfoot. It came out of the woods to the left of us crossing over to the right of the two-lane highway, approximately 400 yards ahead. It couldn't have been anything else. It was bipedal, and its posture was erect, more so than most of the Bigfoot photos I've seen since our sighting. The height was around six and a half feet tall, with long arms, much longer than a man's. And where a human's fingertips may reach just below the hip bone, this Bigfoot's hands swung to just above the top of its knees as it walked. I had the impression that it was young, an adolescent, as the musculature wasn't overly developed. As the days get longer and spring approaches, Bigfoot conference announcements begin to pop up all over the country. To keep us informed on the who's, the what's, and the where's, Chuck Larson's got one of these shows in this week's Spotlight. first ever encounter quest is slated for Saturday, April 1st at the Cole Auditorium in Hamlet, North Carolina. The event will host a series of speakers covering everything from Bigfoot and UFOs to men in black, dogmen, aliens, and much more. Speakers scheduled to appear are Ron Moorhead, Kenny Irish, R. Scott Nelson, and North Carolina's very own Squatch Watchers. Food, crafts, gifts, and everything you would expect will be available. Doors open at 9 and speakers start at 10. Tickets are going fast, so for more information, visit EncounterQuest.com. And that's today's Conference Spotlight. Well, that's about it for us today. It looks like we're all out of time. I'd like to thank you for watching and remind you, if you have any questions, news stories, or videos you'd like to share with us, you can email the show at thisweekinbigfootnewscast at gmail.com. For Mike Lucci and Chuck Larson, I'm Brendan Brown. Until next time, remember, be informed, not biased. Take care.